This is a context setting piece. Um, and of course I have to say that the boundaries of the scholarly record are always evolving. That's nothing new. But there, it seems lately there's a sort of confluence of trends that's really accelerating the evolutionary process. So we're presenting this framework that I hope will help us communicate throughout the day with common concepts and, and common terminology to help us as we discuss the evolving stewardship roles that go along with the evolving scholarly record. First, I wanted to say something about why OCLC got involved in this area. And you, we, we sent you a, an email with a link to this new report that just came out this week, and there are a few copies of it on the registration table. And um, so we s jumped into the fray here for a variety of reasons. We wanted there to be a sort of common reference point for concepts and terms, and we thought a little bit about the OAIS reference model that really helped the library and other communities talk about preservation. So we had a common um, phrasing for the various phases and the various packets that would be exchanged and so forth, and we thought, well, that might be helpful in this area just to facilitate community discussions and across domains as well. We also thought that there were a lot of people addressing parts of the topic uh, for particular audiences and particular purposes, and we wanted to look at a high-level overview that um, uh, helped to reduce fragmentation as people started to think about the, the big picture of the evolving scholarly record and the sort of high-level stakeholder roles. And we also hope that this framework would be useful in both cross-disciplinary and cross-domain conversations to help organize and support and even drive discussions. And we aspired to equip libraries and scholars and funders and publishers and scholarly societies and so on with a resource for strategic planning. So that's a, quite a few aspirations. Um, and one of the outcomes of this workshop, we hope we'll get it, be getting a sense of how useful it is. So we, express, we expect some frank reaction, hope for it anyway. And um, I wanted to be very clear that this work does not attempt to address scholarly processes nor scholarly communication. This is really about the stuff that results from the scholarly processes. Um, the processes and scholarly communication have been addressed very well by uh, many others, Ross Atkinson, Brian Schottlander, Herbert von der Um And this, this, we want to be clear, is about the stuff, the sort of evidence of the process, the outcomes, and the aftermath. So uh, I just wanted to be clear about that before we dig in. So what does a scholarly record look like? The majority to date looks pretty much like this, journals, monographs, but more and more we're seeing data and presentations and social media, blogs, human observations, sensor data, code, algorithms, and visualizations. Quite an expanding picture. Those viewing the scholarly record will see different things depending on their purposes. For researchers, the scholarly record will likely include data and tools. For certain faculty, the scholarly record might be limited to peer-reviewed high-impact journals. For some publishers, the scholarly record might be fairly traditional, books and journal articles, though of course they're increasingly electronic. For librarians, the scholarly record will be what we've tended in the past, what we're grappling with now, and the relations needed to be built with myriad other stakeholders. In all cases, it's clear that formats are shifting from print-based to digital and networked. Boundaries are blurring. It's not just articles and monographs, but it's also data, computer models, blogs, so on. The characteristics are changing from being static and formal and outcome focused to being dynamic, blending formal and informal, 
and with more focus on process, replicability, and leverageability. Stakeholder roles are reconfiguring, generating new paths in the scholarly supply chain. Again, these are, these are not incremental changes, and they require more than an incremental response. So here's the heart of the framework. At the center is what traditionally has been the payload, research outcomes. But the framework conceptualizes the new scholarly record as having much more emphasis on context, on the process and the aftermath, not just focused on the outcomes. It's a deeper and more complex record of scholarly inquiry. Let's take a little walk around the framework. So the top part is the process, the research process. In methods, you might find lab notebooks or computer models or protocols. In evidence, you'll find data sets, primary source documents, and survey results, for instance. Discussion can include proposal reviews, preprints, conference presentations. At the center, we have outcomes, which still includes articles and monographs, but also simulations, performances, and a growing variety of other kinds of end products. At the bottom, you see discussion again, but this time it's after the fact, so we've got reviews and commentary and various online exchanges. Under revision, you might see provision of additional findings, corrections, clarifications. And under reuse, that might include summaries or, or conference presentations or popular media versions. Nothing is fixed. For example, in some fields, a conference presentation may be the outcome. In others, it could be used to inform the outcome. And in others, it may amplify the outcome to reach new audiences. The framework components are not new, nor are they suddenly important but they've been yet to be formalized into the scholarly record through systematic collection, referenceability, and accessibility. As ever, prior work is the foundation of future inquiry. The scholarly record itself is input to new research. There will be different examples for different people, and the same examples can occur in different parts of the framework depending on who's using it and for what purposes. Many of the examples in this um, slide represent places rather than the stuff. Some of the places are parts of the uh, research workflow, and others may be more about access. They're certainly not all offering preservation. So how do we sort out the ones that are serious stewards? What kinds of relationships do we need to build with those who are? And perhaps more importantly, what kind of relationships do we need to build with those that are not? Let's take a look at the stakeholder roles in the evolving ecosystem. In the traditional print configuration, there were well-defined roles and a well-defined flow. Researchers or authors create, publishers fix the outcomes intellectually, legally, physically. Libraries and archives collect, they select, they organize, they preserve and provide access to the outcomes. And researchers, faculty and students use the outcomes. Now we see collecting being disintermediated. This has been happening for some time with licensing of electronic journals and ebooks. Now most of the roles are fulfilled external to the library, though of course we do get the pleasure of paying for them. With social media, both collecting and fixing are taken on by creators and users. Libraries are beginning to take back some of those collecting roles. For instance, the partic participants in the International Internet Preservation Consortium capture blogs as part of their web harvesting, and the Library of Congress is beginning to archive Twitter. Stakeholders and roles are being combined in new ways. When a library publishes open access articles in their institutional repository, they're taking on the fixity role as well as collection. In some cases, scientists build a platform in which they use, create, share, preserve, and provide access to their data, taking on all four roles.
The system-wide view of the scholarly record is more distributed, going beyond traditional collecting institutions, and it's more specialized in the sense that no one can collect everything. We see a need for conscious coordination requiring more explicit collecting responsibilities, more attention to coordination and cooperation because we're now more reliant on external resources for access and we need to build those trust networks for preservation. The very nature of what we're collecting is changing. Research libraries used to try to collect comprehensively, or at least extensively, for a local audience. More and more they're realizing that the ecosystem as a whole will collect comprehensively and only they can collect the things that are unique to their institution, the research outputs or the unique special collections. So this is, this is the translate transition that Lorcan Dempsey uh, describes as changing from an outside-in approach to a more focused inside-out approach. So instead of collecting everything for a local audience, it's collecting locally to sharing, sharing it with a, a much broader audience. Libraries will continue to provide traditional services. There are some newer user-facing roles and some familiar processes are becoming more complex. And we have new roles in a larger ecosystem. Some key characteristics impacting our role as stewards are the increasing volume of content, the increasing complexity and diversity, not to mention the challenges in versioning and citability, and finding our way in the increasingly distributed ecosystem of custodial responsibility. We'll discuss these and more throughout the workshop. So this is the picture I'd like you to fix in your minds for the day. The evolving array of stuff to be curated, the various combinations of stakeholders, roles, and responsibilities, and relationships, and the opportunity to create a whole that's bigger than the sum of the parts. I want to acknowledge the valuable input of expert reviewers who provided feedback on an earlier version of the report. Thanks, Natasha, for being one of those reviewers. And also to credit Brian Lavoie, who led the work in OCLC research, is the primary author of the report, and who allowed me to poach some of his slides. So, there we go. thanks. <laughs>